hello and welcome back to Good Nightmare, a podcast where you might hear a little bit of the heater in the background and I do apologise, but I'm freezing. I hope everyone is coping as best they can in these very strange times. Speaking of strange, today's episode is not a story that I had ever envisioned covering, but it does make sense for the Good Nightmare podcast, given that this is a story that has always terrified me. I hadn't considered even covering the story of Pinocchio until it was mentioned on my podcast Facebook group. So thank you to Alex for the suggestion. As I said, funnily enough, Pinocchio to me has always been a horror story. It's one of the most terrifying Disney films, especially the scene where the children turn into donkeys. But also just the idea of a wooden puppet running around acting like a real child is beyond nightmare fuel. The only version of the story that I've really been able to enjoy is the film Geppetto that stars Jason Alexander. And even then, I'm not a fan of the scenes with the live-action wooden boy. I just really like Geppetto. As with most Disney-adapted tales, the origin of Pinocchio isn't quite as innocent as we may have been led to believe. Similar to Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella and The Little Mermaid, the original story isn't so glamorous or child-friendly. In fact, Pinocchio was originally written as a warning to children of the consequences for misbehaviour. The Adventures of Pinocchio was originally produced as a newspaper serial in the years 1881 and 1882 and was written by Carlo Collodi. Please excuse my terrible accent. I haven't studied Italian since year 11 and that was a lifetime ago. In the story, Geppetto carves Pinocchio from an enchanted piece of wood after hearing it talk to him. He named the puppet after the Pinocchio family, thinking that the luck of their name would bring him good fortune. Geppetto starts by carving Pinocchio's eyes, which stared at him, his nose that immediately started to grow, and then his mouth that started to laugh at the carpenter. As soon as Pinocchio was given hands, he stole Geppetto's wig and put it on his own head. And as soon as he had legs, he kicked Geppetto in the nose. The moment that Geppetto taught Pinocchio how to walk on his stiff wooden legs, Pinocchio used his legs to run straight out of the door. When Geppetto went after him and tried to bring the boy back, Pinocchio refused and stood stock still in the middle of the street. Townsfolk gathered around Geppetto and Pinocchio and assumed that Pinocchio didn't want to return home because Geppetto must be abusive and cruel. And so they set Pinocchio free and jailed Geppetto. Jiminy Cricket also doesn't play as big a role in the story as he does in the Disney film. I've always related Jiminy Cricket to my mum because I think he's one of her favourite Disney characters. In the film, he's cute and he's sweet and he's very smart and incredibly well-dressed. In the story of Pinocchio as it was originally written, he's just a regular talking cricket without the coattails. It's in Chapter 4 that we meet the talking cricket who attempts to guide Pinocchio onto the right path. The cricket tells Pinocchio, Woe to boys who refuse to obey their parents and run away from home. They will never be happy in this world, and when they are older, they will be very sorry for it. But Pinocchio doesn't want to listen. In fact, he becomes so irritated by the cricket's advice that he picks up a hammer, throws it, and kills him. And he doesn't feel bad about it. Not even for a moment. In fact, later on in the story, when he's recounting to Geppetto that he'd killed the cricket, he said it was the cricket's own fault for being so annoying. Pinocchio struggles to learn even a single lesson 
throughout the original chapters of the story. When begging for food after realising that he was incredibly hungry and his father is gone, he is soaked by a man who throws a pail of water over him out of his window. Pinocchio then returns home and attempts to dry his feet on the stove, not realising that wood burns. He burns his feet clean off. Soon after, Geppetto returns from jail and has to climb through the window to see Pinocchio, because, obviously, Pinocchio can't walk without feet. Pinocchio complains of being hungry, and so Geppetto offers him the only food that he has, three pears, which Pinocchio refuses to eat unless Geppetto peels them for him first. After some deliberation, Geppetto decides to give Pinocchio new feet and a new book so that he can go to school. Pinocchio seems grateful at first, claiming that he'll go to school and he'll learn and he'll contribute to the household, especially after finding that Geppetto had sold his only coat to be able to afford to send Pinocchio to school. However, on the way to school, the following day, Pinocchio runs away to join a marionette show, selling his only book for four pennies to join. The talking cricket returns as a ghost for a short time in an attempt to warn Pinocchio to stay away from some assassins that would do him harm. But again, Pinocchio doesn't listen. As though the story isn't dark enough with imprisonment and loss of limbs, Pinocchio is caught by these assassins who threaten to kill his father before hanging Pinocchio from an oak tree. Pinocchio hangs from the limb of the oak tree until he turns limp and his eyes begin to glaze over in death. Apparently, this is where the story was supposed to end. Kalori wanted to teach young boys a lesson about the dangers of disobedience, but the editor of the newspaper asked him to continue the story until it came to a happier conclusion. Enter the blue fairy who saves Pinocchio's life. I wish she hadn't. I really hate that puppet. <laughs> the chapters following show a repentant Pinocchio, who eventually learns his lesson and stays home to take care of his poor father Geppetto. Again, the talking cricket returns, and this time Pinocchio bows to him and tells the cricket to throw a hammer at his head in return for having killed the little creature. The cricket doesn't take revenge, however, Instead, he concludes the story by telling Pinocchio, I am going to spare both the father and the son. I have only wanted to remind you of the trick you long ago played upon me, to teach you that in this world of ours, we must be kind and courteous to each other, if we want to find kindness and courtesy in our own days of trouble. Kalori had written this story based on the philosophy of how to raise a child expressed in Emile or On Education by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau believed that children should be taught by experience rather than by book, learning the consequences of their actions naturally. Pinocchio was allowed through the original chapters of this story to make his own choices and face his own dire consequences, including, as I said originally, dying for them. Personally, I think I prefer this original story to the Disney remake, possibly because it's the imagery in the Disney film that really scared me. While Pinocchio is disobedient in both stories, and the tale doesn't stray too far from the original there's something a little bit more adventurous and enjoyable about the text. Pinocchio is very cheeky and has a lot more personality, even though he's not exactly the nicest kid or puppet. I think part of the reason why I absolutely despise Pinocchio and especially the live action is because I have a fear of anything that's made to look human and alive that isn't human or alive. Think androids, robots, mannequins, especially the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disney, which was one of the spookiest rides I've ever been on. 
It's just too real, but also unreal at the same time. Although rumour has it, some of the skeletons in that ride are made from actual human bones. So I guess that's a little more on the real side, but still creepy. If you'd like to read the story in full, it's a little long for an episode, although if you are interested, I'd be happy to record it as one. I'll leave a link in the description for this episode. It's free to read on Project Gutenberg. In fact, if you would like me to read the original story up to the point where Collotti had intended it to end with the hanging, maybe you shoot me a message on my social media and let me know. You can catch me on Facebook on the group Good Nightmare Pod, on Twitter or Instagram at goodnightmare underscore s, or you can email me at goodnightmare underscore s at outlook.com. Thanks again to Alex for this suggestion and to the website today I found out that gave me a little bit more of a glimpse into the original story that I was not expecting. Until next time, sweet dreams.